Welcome to my first video. Today we're gonna do. I'm gonna beat your ass. First, I just wanted to say that I used to have a YouTube channel where I would make cybersecurity related stuff. However, I wanted to start fresh, which is why I made this channel, which you should totally subscribe to, by the way. Like I was saying, today. Bruh. <laughs> like I was saying, today, we're gonna talk about a buffer overflow and how to exploit it. Well, what is a buffer overflow? Let's pretend we were beginners and we tried to Google this. Let's let's see what would happen. Uh, uh, ah! No wonder you clicked on this video, that is ugly as f And I love it. Listen, what do we as ethical hackers love more than anything in this entire world? Exploits. Now what could be more beautiful than an exploit this close? to the bare metal of your computer. Well, whatever you're thinking, it's wrong, okay? Because there's nothing more beautiful than an exploit this close to the bare metal of your computer. Credit where credit is due. I'm not knocking any of those resources that I showed. Uh, I think they're fantastic and you should definitely give them a read or watch the videos. Pretty sure the way that I learned how to do buffer overflows was from the Cyber Mentors video. So there are definitely resources out there. I'm just adding onto the pile. Listen, I get it. When I was starting out, these buffer overflows were like the banes of every- the banes? The, the bane of- the, they were like the main antagonist of everyone's journey. In any hacking certification that had a buffer overflow in it, you would be getting a hundred or so questions, mainly about them and- Yeah, I totally understand why. But, some good news. Buffer overflows? especially the stack-based variety which we're going to be explaining today, only get easier the more you do them. They will become extremely intuitive after a couple times exploiting them. And you end up seeing some really, really cool techniques like bypassing ASLR, NX, making ROP chains, brute forcing stack canaries. I mean, that just sounds so cool. So if you don't get it right away, you're not alone and you don't need to worry about it too much. Just start hacking and keep on hacking and sooner or later, it'll become second nature to you. Now the acutely astute amongst you would say something like oh oh how are you going to talk about buffer overflows but not tell us what they are it's been so long you spent like half a shut your bitch ass up we spent like a day and a half talking about all this stuff but let's actually get down to the internals the, the disgusting parts of our computers the, the the horrible chaotic little cities of our cpus let's just get on with it so for the 900th time what is a buffer overflow well I like the way that Imperva puts it, or that's how you say their name, I don't know. I, I like the fact that they just have an under DDoS attack, question mark. <laughs> Buffers are basically memory storage regions that temporarily hold data. A buffer overflow, or buffer overrun, and no one, no one calls it a buffer overrun by the way, occurs when the volume of data exceeds the storage capacity of the memory buffer. I, that's, that should be intuitive, you can't put more past its capacity. That's basically the premise of a buffer overflow. You're overflowing the capacity of how much a buffer is allowed to contain or hold. That's it. What do you mean that's it? That sounds like a computer's equivalent to a first world problem. Why? That doesn't even sound like anything. <laughs> and that's why you'd be the perfect target. Luckily for you, however, modern compilers and languages do a pretty good job of making sure you don't absolutely sh** the bet. You'd be surprised how the most seemingly boring and least threatening vulnerabilities give birth to the most destructive and ingenious exploits. The, the buffer overflow, although it seems like a I asked for a vanilla and you guys gave me vanilla with whipped cream type of problem. Rest assured these attacks are a glinting diamond in the sand for hackers. I know this seems super non-threatening. This exploit seems super just arbitrary. A, a computer science experiment gone wrong. But listen, where do you think those extra bytes that you supply? Where do you think they go? Those extra bytes have to go somewhere and you're writing over very important sh which as we'll see will be our way in. Speaking of which, if you have a computer somewhere out there or if it's just your computer and you've got a program running or something running and it's vulnerable to this buffer overflow like for example you have a a program running on your computer that's asking you for a password but you can overflow it this vulnerability could be the reason why someone either gets into your machine or someone escalates their privileges on your machine and that's it once you've privilege escalated you have full control you have complete 
access to that device that is yours now. And if you were confused on the practicality of this kind of exploit and where it's actually used out in the wild, well this is it. Typically that's the reasons why we attack them and that's what we get in turn, either access or control. You still here? Well, you should be really happy, okay? Let's check our checklist right now. This is what you know so far. You know what a buffer overflow is, and you know when it's used and what it's used for. Now, let's actually move on, taking a look at a real example. This is not gonna be something crazy. It's just gonna be a simple C program that you don't even need to know how to program, okay? Because I'm gonna tell you what it's doing, but let's just consider the following C code, okay? Don't freak out, I'll explain it. But first, let's just compile this and let's just run it. And I swear to God, if I have to open up Neo him more than one time because I made some stupid, stupid syntax error. I'm going to give myself pains piercings and then headbutt a fucking car battery. Okay, the compilation was fine, everything was fine, we did this with no problems, for once. Now we can actually start talking about the code itself, okay? This is really simple. So we have two functions. We have the main function, which is just calling another function inside of it that we've set up outside, which is just secure. So we just have main and then we have secure, these two functions. And inside of secure, we've set up a buffer with the size of 200 bytes. That's its limit. That's how much we're allowed to put into it. And although this is a buffer overflow video, this code is perfectly secure. Because if you see in that input line, we're using the read function to read 200 bytes maximum into that buffer. This is crucial because this means that those two values, the amount that we're allowed to input and the size of the buffer matches. The inputted amount doesn't go over it, which will cause a buffer overflow as we'll see. And then we have some basic echoing stuff where we just read out what user supplied and how many bytes they supply. We can actually prove this and we can do this by trying to just barrage this program with as many bytes as we want and nothing will happen. It won't crash. We won't get a seg fault. Uh, eventually we will reach a point where we break the actual pipe, but that doesn't matter for this video. But yeah, this, this is perfectly secure. No matter how many bytes we put, it's not gonna start overflowing that buffer. And more importantly, start overflowing the stack. Fine, that's cool. But now, take a look at this degenerate function. In this function, all we've changed is the amount in that input line. Now it doesn't align with the value of the buffer. It, we've explicitly stated in this program that we're allowed to input more than the buffer can hold. And we can even see that when we try to compile this, the compiler will tell us, it will scream at us, telling us that what we're trying to do is ludicrously insecure. Now if we do the same thing that we did last time, obviously, as expected, we get a segmentation fault, which means the program has crashed. We've corrupted the memory. Now for this next part, I'm going to elicit the help of my wonderful friend, GDB Pina, which is just a debugger for Linux. And this lets us interact with the program and we can actually start disassembling and debugging the code as, as it's running, which makes this so much easier to understand. The only caveat is that it's all in assembly. So this is going to look very alien, but I will try my best to explain it to you guys. Oh, and another thing that I forgot, in order to debug and view the function names inside of this debugger, we need to make sure that our binary or our application or program or whatever is not stripped. If it was stripped, all those symbol names, i.e. the function names, all that stuff, would not be visible as easily as this. That reminds me, when we're doing any kind of work like this with binaries, there's a ton of tools to help us set the scope of what we need to be doing. For example, we can use checksec to figure out what defense mechanisms are on the application. We can use file to see if it's stripped, what kind of architecture this binary is made for, like 32-bit or 64-bit. And for the sake of this video and the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna do all this in 32-bit uh, just so it's easier to look at. It's great that we can attach our binary to the debugger and now we can start tinkering with this program. Let me create a sort of guideline for what binary exploitation looks like before I introduce the topic separately. I know this is a bit backwards, but just bear with me. I think it'll be helpful for beginners to hear the terms first and then everything else after it. So here's the outline for this type of exploit, but just remember that every exploit is different. But many types of exploits share similar patterns. In a stack-based buffer overflow exploit, the template is as follows for the most part. Assuming there aren't any defense mechanisms, number one, see if you can overflow the stack or crash the program. Check. Find out how many bytes it takes to crash the program. This is called the offset, more specifically the EIP offset. 
but more on that later. Three, confirm the EIP offset by using what I call the B test. Four, after confirming that we can control the execution flow of the program, either use or create some shellcode to exploit the program, which is inadvisable in the case of no execute or a data execution prevention, so NX or DEP, or return to something, i.e. ret2 based attacks. And number five is that's it. You've exploited it. By this point in time, you would have made the program do what you wanted it to do. With the guidelines now finished, we can start talking about some of the little mechanisms at play here, starting with the ever so popular EIP register. The EIP register or instruction pointer holds the address of what's being executed. Think of this as a finger literally pointing at an address and telling the CPU what's going to be running. Those that we barraged the program with before, as we discussed, had to go somewhere. And the normal behavior of this complication is for the A's to be copied down further in the stack, overwriting important data on the way. One crucial piece of data that was overwritten was the return address. A return address is used so that after a function finishes executing, it can return control to the original caller. In other words, it's important because without it, a program literally can't return to itself to finish running after calling a function. Well, how does this return address show up in the first place? Let me introduce you to the call instruction. The call instruction places the return address of a function at the top of the stack. So when a function is called with the call instruction, the return address of said function will already be on the stack waiting to be put into the EIP register so that the function can exit and return execution flow to the original program. The return instruction takes the value from the top of the stack, i.e. from the stack pointer or ESP register, and it puts it into the EIP register, which will then get executed and thus the execution flow is restored and the function exits or returns. Obviously this is very technical stuff and please don't be afraid to rewatch parts you're not completely understanding yet and better yet try to follow along but at your own pace. It's taken me a pretty long time to get comfortable with it but just remember persistence and exposure. Don't give up and keep surrounding yourself with these types of things and sooner or later it'll eventually make sense to you. Something that trips a lot of people up when they first start is being able to differentiate between the assembly stuff like a register and an instruction. A lot of people will see a rat or the return instruction as something else. Just remember that it's an instruction okay like like when you were a gym teacher <laughs> when you were a gym when you were in gym and the teacher gave you an instruction to, I don't know, form a line or something like that. I don't know, what do people do in gym? Just think of it like that. So we have the call instruction, which is just instructing certain things to happen. And the ret instruction is the same thing. They're literally instructions. The registers are just tiny storages for the CPU. The registers are different. They're not instructions, but they're used with instructions, okay? They're just tiny little segments of storage. Very, very tiny. Okay, here comes the fun part. Let's get our little hacker hands dirty and exploit this fugly binary. Remember that we're still trying to enumerate the information in order for us to complete step two. That is, we still need to find the number of bytes it took to crash the program. The program crashed because we overwrote the return address, remember? So when the EIP was given the return address, it was a completely bogus address that didn't mean anything. It was our A's, our hex 41414141. Now, knowing this, we can understand why trying to find this offset is vital. If we can overwrite the return address that EIP tries to execute, then what if we overflow the stack just enough to get to the EIP and then supply our own malicious address for the EIP to execute? That, my friend, is the entire essence of this kind of exploit, and it's precisely the kind of thing we're going to be doing. You may be wondering how exactly we're going to be able to discern where the EIP starts getting overwritten when all we've supplied is just a bunch of A's. Another ingenious method appears. We're going to use cyclical patterns. Just as A's show up as hex 41, the pattern will show up in its hex form as well, but it'll be unique. It won't just be a bunch of A's. And because it's unique, we can then find out exactly where it is. We can do this in a lot of ways, but luckily there's a command inside of GDB that we can use called pattern create, and then we supply the length that we want to create. Let's keep this length the same value as it took to crash the program. Uh, we initially supplied it with 400 if you remember, so let's just stick to that. Although since we have the source code, we know it's smaller than that, but you know, let's assume we didn't. Okay, let's supply the command and... Oh. Yeah, we should also specify a file name so the output gets saved to the file rather than assault our eyes with the eyes where that this pattern is. Actually, it's, it's quite beautiful, but I digress. Now, with the pattern created, we can run the program with the pattern being the input. This time, instead of our A's, it's going to be this pattern. Great. The program crashed. Take a look at the value inside of the EIP register, which can be found all over the place, but just take a look at it. To turn this into what we're looking for, we can run another GDB command, pattern offset, and the value inside of the EIP. Let's give this a try. Awesome. 
we have our supposed EIP offset. That's step two done, and we're almost done with our enumeration. We now need to verify this value by utilizing what I call the, the B test. This test is essentially using the newly acquired EIP value, or sorry, offset, and inputting four bytes after it to see if the expected value is actually inside of the EIP. If it is, it means we've successfully overwritten the EIP, and this means that we control the execution flow of the program, which is extremely exciting stuff. Great. Time for step four. We finally get to be Hollywood hackers. We finally get to be those people that all those sir, 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 help me with this, sir, help me with that questions go to, okay? <laughs> okay. Listen, remember what I said about this step? We could either supply our own shellcode or return to something, usually a function that's insecure, or we could create a wrap chain, but that's not in the scope of this video. Well, we can't use shellcode here. Take a look at this and tell me if you know why. That's right. It's because of this pesky, pesky little defense mechanism known as no execute or NX. And without getting too far into what NX is, which don't worry, I'll probably make a video solely on the various kinds of defenses out there for binaries, but just know that NX means that the stack is non-executable. That means our shellcode would be rendered more useless than those garlic goblins behind you when you're not looking. That leaves us with the ret2 based attacks, the return2 based attacks. In this video, we've assumed a lot of things. For one, we actually compile the binary ourselves. Source code is invaluable because it saves you from the painstakingly long time it requires to actually debug and reverse engineer. Luckily, there are tools like some debuggers and decompilers out there that can lighten this load like Hopper, uh, Gidra, Radar 2, Radare, I don't, I don't know, and, and other stuff, but it's still a very long process nonetheless. Another thing that's important to mention is that in the case of this return based attack that we're going to be doing, we actually can't do it right now, not in this binary, because the ret based attack requires us to return to some sort of function that we can leverage inside of the binary. And I mean like, what the hell can we even use in this program? Nothing. So this is where we're going to negate this headache by just creating a new program with a pwnable function inside of it. In this program, although the hack me function was never called inside of main, meaning that it would never run, it's just dead code, we get to see where this buffer overflow attack really shines and how gorgeous this type of attack is. We could just find the address of the hack me function and return to it, even though it was never ever called in the program. Think about that, that's like you including a function inside of a program that was never ever meant to be run, but if we can return to it, the function will run. Okay, let's attach this to GDB. Notice how when we disassemble hack me, there's a call to the system function and above it is a push of an address. Take notes of things like this. When you see a function call with an address being pushed right above it, chances are that the address being pushed is likely an argument for the function being called. This doesn't matter to us because we know the source code, but if this was a black box or, or if we were hacking blind, we'd be able to see this argument being supplied to system. But anyways, let's continue. We have the address of hack me right here, but we can also get it by p hack me. With this address, we can start creating our evil buffer, our payload, our exploit. I should also mention that because we're dealing with a 32-bit binary, we need to keep in mind the endingness. Don't worry about this too much, but just remember that when it comes to creating our exploits, we need to keep the addresses that we're going to be using in reverse order or in least significant byte first. You'll, you'll see what I mean when I get there, but another thing to remember is that although this address seems totally normal, this is actually incomplete. A hex address in x86 or 32-bit is 4 bytes long or 32 bits. This isn't a 32 bit address and that's because the leading zero actually gets cut off here but that's super easy to remedy and with that done we can move on to one last final thing before exploiting the program. There's a lot of debate between exploit devs on whether they use python 3 or python 2 to construct their payload. In this video we'll use python 2 since it's simpler but know that you can do you can 100% do the same thing in python 3 but just with a little bit of typecasting or tweaking and we can also use some very super powerful things like pwn tools but seeing as we're first learning we should always learn to do it manually before resorting to the heavy lifters look at where we are we have the executable offset and the address of the pwnable function which we still need to alter for use remember the endianness all that's left for us is to combine all of this together in order to perform a symphony of exploitation 
Look at how much we've done to get to this point. This is truly one of the most beautiful exploits out there, in my opinion. And this is one of the simpler examples as well. Now follow my lead. To construct this payload that we're going to supply the program, we need to do it in this order. Take the offset and combine it, concatenate it with the address of the pointable function. Reversed, of course. And when I say reversed, I mean you split this address up and reverse the order. Don't reflect it. That's another pitfall a lot of people do, but reverse, not reflected. Anyways, see, nothing crazy here. Let's do this in Python 2 because remember, it's less hassle for us right now. We can redirect this output straight into this binary using output redirection or we could save the output into a file and cat it into the binary. It doesn't matter which one you do, the fate of this binary has already been sealed. Let's do both. And just so we're all on the same page, what the hackme function will do is create a file called hacked.txt and then list the current directory. That's the same argument we saw being supplied into system. So that's what it's going to do. That's how we'll know that we've actually exploited it. Look at that, we did it. We exploited the shit out of this program and leveraged a super awesome vulnerability. Give yourselves a round of applause, some pats on the back. As a bonus, I won't just leave you with all this information. Instead, we'll exploit our first buffer overflow challenge from ROP Emporium together. And hopefully, you seeing this in action will help crystallize this information. As a bonus bonus, I also did this challenge, capstone project, whatever, after staying awake for an entire day. So please excuse the almost corpse-like energy and the boneheaded mistakes you're about to see, but if anything, that should showcase some common pitfalls as well. Okay, let's start off by actually getting the binary from ROP Emporium. Let's just try this one, because this is along the same lines of what we've been doing this entire video. Okay, with the binary and everything here, the first thing we remember we need to do is check the security. We don't have the source code here, so we need to take extra precaution here. Okay, we can see that it's very similar to our previous example. We've got NX on it, which means that we can't use shellcode here and that it's in 32-bit, so a little Indian. Let's interact with the binary. We can run strings on it to get more information about it as well. This just has all the symbol names in it. And I didn't know this, but strings actually will only show you these names if the, the length is four or higher. Which is really cool, I learned that recently, but yeah, so this gives us thing, we see some text over here, this is probably what is going to get printed to us. And we can see this, which seems like a command for something like system to take. Um, let's just interact with this, let's see what this program's got to offer. Okay, so we see from our first trick, I will attempt to fit 56 bytes of user input into 32 bytes of stack buffer. This is exactly what we've been learning so far and we already know this is illegal and i'm gonna call the cops on this binary but uh you there may i have your input please and don't worry about null bytes <laughs> we're using read okay that's good because null bytes is a completely different video in itself okay let's just write nice okay so that worked. let's try to overflow this i don't know how many bytes are there so typically you want to I don't want to start off that big, but no. Okay, 100 was in. Oh, wait. <laughs> Forgot that, the, you know, we really didn't need that money, but it's fine, whatever. So, we overflew the program. Um, we can check. I mean, we could do this inside of GDB to prove it, but a quicker way is just through D message. See, over here, we can see that there was a segmentation fault, and I. The EIP or the instruction pointer had a value of these A's, which, as we know, remember, um, that is an A. Do you remember that? Four one A. So yeah. So we know we can overflow it. Let's let's try to get a. Let's try to figure out what the offset is now. So 
So we created the pattern and uh, outputted it to a file called pattern.txt. Now we're going to run the program with this as an input. As expected, the program crashed and our EIP currently holds a value of this. So we can see this in a lot of different locations. We can see this here. We can see the EIP here, right? And yeah, so let's figure out what the offset is. Uh -huh. 44 bytes before we start running into the EIP. And let's do the B test. So. This should work, and we should see that the EIP now holds a value of 42 because 41 was A, 42 will be B. And just like we thought, the IP instruction pointer now holds a value of this, which means we can control the execution flow of this program. This is at our mercy now. Now that we have the EIP offset, we've proven it. We need to, we can't use shellcode because remember we have NX enabled. So we have to find something inside of this binary to return to. So let's open this up in GDB. And let's see what functions there are here. We have a pwn me function, which is exactly the same as, as the hack me function we're talking about. So we could pretty much return to that. Uh, we can actually see what it does. Let's let's see what it does. Jesus. Ah, I see. So this is actually the thing that's asking us for our input. This is the insecure function. Uh, and I can tell this by seeing that it's outputting a lot. Right? Remember, these are arguments. These are arguments. Uh, if you see a call to a function and a push above it, typically you would see that as an argument for that function. But we can see that this is the function that prints out that text and takes in our input. Remember that I was using read as well. So, so that's not it. Um, what about this one? What about write to win? Ah, this is a good sign. So. We see a system, we see system being called. Let's see what system is being supplied with. Okay, so this is our way in. This is our way to exploit this binary. If we can return to this function, because remember, it didn't get called. This is just dead code here. If we can return to this function, this will print the contents of that flag. So let's get the address of right to it. So, I mean, it is right here. But, you know, it's good to exercise our GDB skills. So there's our address. And now we can start working on that exploit. So see how nicely that B test just allows itself to get replaced with our code. So, is your right? And you might be looking at this and saying, where's that zero coming from? But as we talked about, the leading zero gets cut off. So. We do have to include this, okay? Otherwise, it's not a proper, it's not a proper value, a hex address. So. Oh, and I also made a mistake. Forgot that this is 32-bit, so a little ending, which means that it's reversed, right? The least byte. So just, just, just damn it. Honestly, I could have imported like home tools or, or struct to just do this for me, but that's a lot of work. <laughs> so, I mean, I, someone can argue that this is more, but you know what? I'm a little lazy, so. And now if we run this, we should see that the contents of flag gets outputted because it got catted out by that system command. And something went wrong. All right. I forgot, this is Python 3. Python 3 is a little weird when it comes to this kind of stuff. Python 2, if we do it with this, this should give us our flag. And there it is, there's our flag, we did it. 
we completely exploited this program and we owned it. And that's it. We have we got the flag. Let's do this inside of GDB to see what output gets outputted. Um, we can actually put this inside of an export file. So exploit.txt and run this inside of GDB to see what kind of output we get. <laughs> there we go. Where is our flag? Oh, right here. Oh yeah, nice. Even though this channel and all the videos therein are all just passion projects, I, I really, really appreciate you sticking around. Obviously, videos like this take a ton of time to create and even more to edit, so if you enjoy this video and want to join my botnet, <laughs> kidding, if you want to be notified when I make more of these videos, which I, I surely will be, consider subscribing. And thank you so much for your time and for watching, and I hope you learned something. Until next time, goodbye.